funny thing is, it's okay. The last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say. Word of God speak, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place, please let me stay. Finding myself in the midst of you, beyond the music, beyond the noise. All that I need is to be with you and in the quiet, hear your voice. Finding myself at a loss for words, and the funny thing is, it's okay. Sometimes sorrow is the door to peace. Sometimes heartache is the key.
Bienvenidos a todo, mucho gusto todo. This morning, welcome, it's Palm Sunday and we're happy to greet you here at South Shores. It's good to have you here. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. Father, thank you for letting us come into your house. Thank you for letting us be here to worship you to celebrate who you are and who you have made us to be. We thank you, invite you to our hearts and lives today. Speak to us, change us. We worship you in Jesus' name, amen. to be in church this morning. Amen.
for you Cause when we see you We find strength to taste the day And in your presence All our fears are washed away Washed away Hosanna! every year at South Shores, and it's a tradition for a long, long time. So, uh...
Well, the Bible says that children are a blessing from the Lord. Blessed is the man who has his quiver full of them. And we're going to have a baby dedication today. It's really a parent baby dedication because in God's word, in one of the most significant scriptures is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, starts verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the people of God, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Teach this to your children. Talk about it when you sit down, when you stand up, when you're lying down, when you're going around, whenever and wherever, include God and God talk in the conversations. Grow your family in what's called the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so we want to be doing that. We're committing, we want, uh, uh, when parents are dedicating themselves and their children, they're saying, we're going to give our child a chance, not just at church, but at home to see God's qualities modeled and talked about and lifted up and we want to live by God's God's guidance all the time and so when we have a dedication this way we dedicate the parent we dedicate the child we as a church once again dedicated ourselves that we are going to have lots of opportunities for children to learn about Jesus and to grow in his word and in his love and uh, so uh, we're going to have one little guy dedicated today what's special for me is he's also my grandson and uh, so come on up Jet bring your mom and dad up here Jet has two older brothers, John and James, and Jet. Come here, you better take this. Come here. Look at it. Can you see everybody? Look at it. Do you want to start? Am I a star? Yeah, you all love you. Is this me? Okay, fantastic. Um, so my prayer has always been for all our boys is that they be a blessing to all those around them, and that in that, it is all pointed to Jesus. That while this world is confusing and bumps might and absolutely will happen, that their, their foundation is so solid in the truth of the gospel that they know for a fact that there is a forgiving and loving father that is wanting to have a relationship with them. And the verse we picked, uh, the verse we picked today is also from Deuteronomy and very similar, um, but is what does, the, what does the Lord God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. And that came from Deuteronomy 10, 12. So... So you as parents are committing yourself to raise this child in the Lord. We are. And you as a church, are you committing yourself? Then stand up and let's pray together, shall we? Dear Jesus, we thank you for this little guy. We thank you for Jet and for his life. We thank you for his mom and his dad and his brothers and his grandparents and the privilege that he has of growing up in a family that knows and loves Jesus, that wants you in their lives. I pray that he will learn of you early and often, that he will make his own commitments to you, to follow you with his whole life, to be a leader among your people, to know your word, to delight in his relationship with you, and to make a difference in this world. And so I thank you that we as a church are committed as well, that we will provide opportunities for children. We will provide leaders and space and resources so that they can come to know Jesus and to live for you. Fill us with your spirit, we pray, and we thank you for these little guys. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. Just a minute. I'm supposed to do two things, and I forgot. Yo, you can be seated. You can be seated. But the other is, we don't take an offering on Sundays. We have boxes that we hide in the corner if you can find them. 
but I want to thank you for your generosity because it provides resources for things like our children or for our missionaries. You're going to hear about one later. I hope you get excited about it. You just spell van, V-A-N. Remember that. Um, we're helping a little church. And so as we give our gifts to the Lord, God uses those to, so that the good news of Jesus and his story can continue to go out. Next week's Easter. So if you have any friends here at church, carpool next week, okay? Um, there will be parking down in the parking lot below us in the shopping center and over at St. Anne's, but uh, parking will be at a premium, and uh, so find one of those spots. They'll be telling you more about all of the services we have, or come earlier in the day. If you possibly could get your wig on and your teeth in in time, <laughs> come early. There's a 6.30 service in the morning, and uh, you know, to get yourself, I mean, if, whatever you got to do to get ready, you know, to be at church. All right, let's, let's pause and pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for all that you give to us. Thank you that we can give gifts so that your word can continue to move forward. We pray that we will be found faithful, that we will be like you, we will be generous, and uh, we will be passionate about people knowing Jesus, not just with our resources, but with our time and our talents as well. May we take have the courage this week to talk to a family member, to a neighbor, to a friend, to say, hey, it's Easter coming up. Come to church with me on Easter and hear some good news. And so fill us with yourself, we pray. And uh, thank you that we can be generous like you. In your name we pray. Amen.
get a Hosanna. Woo! I love Easter. This is my favorite time of year. I just love thinking about Christ and the resurrection. And we've got a lot going on this week. And it starts at 7.30 on Thursday morning. What is that, right? So every Tuesday, our staff gets together and we pray. It's our prayer time. And this last Tuesday, Pastor Micah brought us into just a lovely special time where we were preparing our hearts for what's about to happen next week. There's going to be a lot of busy things that going on, but the most important thing is that our hearts are prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. So we want you to do the same. We want you to join us on Thursday morning at 730 uh, for a time of prayer as we usher in Holy Week, and you're going to be inviting your friends, as Pastor Ty said, to come to all the services that we have on Thursday night, on Friday night, on Saturday is a perfect opportunity to invite those neighbors, and we're going to help you out. We've got flyers all over campus. We've got hundreds of them, so please pick up some of these and invite your neighbors, your friends. If you're in the grocery store, take a whole pile in and just give them to people so that they can come and hear about the good news of Jesus Christ next week. Coming um, up right after this service at 1230 over in the Ocean Room, Pastor Derek is going to tell us about his mission trip. He and his wife Rebecca went there about um, about a couple months ago. They went to India, and they want to share with you all the great and wonderful things that are happening on that mission trip and to learn a little bit more about how we're helping to spread the good news over there. And there's going to be some light Indian snacks, so you want to make sure that you you, uh, join them at 1230. And then um, we partner with several churches um, around Orange County because we want to spread the good news of the gospel, not just here at South Shores, but in other churches. Uh, We help to plant churches. We want to come alongside them and give them resources and help and support and bolster them up. And you're going to hear a video right now of a church up in uh, Compton. It's called LA One, and you're going to hear from the pastor, and we're going to see the great things they're doing and then a way that you can help them out. Hello, South Shores Church. This is Pastor Chan from LA One Church from Compton, California. Thank you so much for being a faithful, selfless supporter of a small church plant. Since you have generously and prayerfully and financially supported us last year, we have grown in number and in love for the church and the community. What we do here in Compton is clearly stated in three mission statements. We worship and serve one God. We proclaim and teach one truth about Lord Jesus Christ. We unite and reach one community at a time, starting here in Compton and to the ends of the earth and the power of the Holy Spirit. To do just that, we share the gospel every Sunday at the foyer of 99 Cent Store because we rent a small room right next to the entry of 99 Cent Store. We engage in mission every month by giving out Bibles, gospel tracts, backpacks, food, market gift cards, and daily essentials for our community. Through this ministry, we have three families that joined us over the years. Your financial support makes this mission possible. Lastly, we're raising support for our first church van. We want to carry our church equipment from our storage to worship location. We also have outreach ministry for the children in our community, so we'll be able to pick them up for Sunday services, retreats, Christ honoring, field trips, and Bible studies. Your gracious offering will make this dream become reality. Thank you so much for allowing us to share our prayer request with you and your church. Thank you, darling. So if you'd like to help, just uh, put van or church van on, the, on, your, on your check or however you'd like to help, and, and we'll get, make sure we get that to them. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing time of year that you sent your son Jesus Christ and he finished the work, Lord, by saving us from our sins and becoming our savior and the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Father God, we pray for LA Church. Lord, thank you that we had the opportunity to partner with them. Lord, continue to use uh, our resources to help them as they're spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in Compton. Father, I thank you for the uh, sermon that you've given to Pastor Ty, Pastor Micah this morning, uh, Father, may uh, his words penetrate through our hearts so that we can hear the message that you've given him for us to hear this morning, and we may take that and put it into action as we do indeed share the good news of Jesus Christ to those that we meet this week. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, church. This morning, we are going to be in John chapter 10. So you can already turn in your Bibles to John 10. While you are turning there, I want you to think with me before we begin. What is the good life? What is the good life? What is the first thing that comes into your mind when you think of what the good life is? Even here in Dana Point, the Dana Point slogan is harboring the good life. So what is it? When you start to ask people, they have different answers. It could be a life of ease or maybe a fat bank account or stock portfolio or you getting to do what you love every day. So for you, what is the good life? In searching for an answer this week, I went to one of the AI websites and asked it, what is the good life? And I promise the rest of this sermon was not written by AI. <laughs> At least that's what it told me to say. Um, all kidding aside, what it, the answer it gave me, it, it said this, it said, the definition of the good life is a question pondered for centuries. There's no single answer, as it depends on individual values, goals, and circumstances. It goes on to list things like happiness and fulfillment, meaningful relationships, health and well-being, purpose, growth and learning, security and freedom is all factors of a good life. And then it finished with this. It said, Ultimately, the good life is a personal journey. By reflecting on your values and, and what brings you happiness and fulfillment, you can define your own version of the good life and pursue it with passion and purpose. Basically, it took a whole page to just say, you do you, <laughs> right? Choose your own adventure. And when you start to think about, man, that's my version of the good life. Whatever I want it to be, it kind of starts seeming like nothing, like hollow. If all we're to do is maximize our pleasure and minimize our pain, achieving whatever we think is our full potential in this very small life or this temporary life, as it talks about in Ecclesiastes, that this life is it's like a mist. It's here today and then gone tomorrow. But in between, you just do what you want, whatever feels good to you. That's rather bleak, isn't it? And when you start to think about all the different people and organizations and companies that are trying to convince you what the good life is, usually it's so that you buy their product, it's almost overwhelming. Even think of last month, when you were watching the Super Bowl, companies paid $7 million for a 30-second commercial to try to sell you something, a version of the good life. So as long as you bought their car, their supplements, the bag of potato chips, man, you are all set to go. Whatever is, seems good to you. I mean, we have more people telling us what the good life is than we can count. Is it the social media influencer telling you with the mansion and the Rolls Royce or maybe with the six-pack abs or the, the wittiest political take? Everyone has a different version of what the good life is. So who do you believe? Do you believe our perfectly due two presidential candidates? <laughs> Maybe not. Do you believe your gut, ourselves, wherever it's leading you, like, like the AI answer? And if, if so, how is that going for us? This past week, the World Happiness Report by Gallup was dropped. I don't know if, if any of you saw this. If you haven't, you should look it up. They've been doing this since 2012, measuring the average happiness levels across the globe by country. And people fill out these surveys from a 1 to 10 uh, measurement on how happy they are. And the good old US of A, we come in at a strong 25th. And yet, in our time, we are focusing more time and effort on being happy and experiencing less of it. How many of us have heard parents, man, 
my only desire for my kids is that they will be happy. And so we're not doing very well. And so for those of us that follow Jesus, we have to ask, well, what does Jesus say about the good life? What, is, what does he say about this? And he, he's rather clear. In John 10.10, 10, he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That you may have life, or you can translate it to the full. Think of like when you get your coffee, right? And they fill it all the way to the top and you pour a little out and put all the cream, sugar, and spice and everything nice and get it just how you like, but it's too hot to drink. And so you're, you're walking back to your table, but very carefully. That is what the abundant life is. Any little misstep, man, it is flowing over. That your life is so abundant. It is so full. It is so robust. That is the life that Jesus comes to give. To give us, not just because of eternity, not because of the quantity of time, but life's at its imagined best. Jesus comes to bring life and bring it abundantly. And I know many of you have been Christians for for decades. Are you living the abundant life that Jesus brought? How many Christians do you know are living in the abundant life that he speaks of? Because a temptation for us is to take this robust, powerful faith that we have in Jesus Christ and domesticate it. To put it in this little box, in this one hour on Sunday mornings, or, you know, just, I, that's someone I talk about, but Jesus, that guy, but when I need to make decisions, man, I, I just follow my gut and I just go with that. Man, that's like, you know, Pastor Derek used the illustration of off-roading in the chute a few weeks ago. That's like you buying, man, this souped-up off-road vehicle with the massive gripping tires and and the suspension and, and all the torque power you could ever purchase. Man, and you never leave Laguna Niguel. Man, you see them on the road, don't you? Man, they are clean, and they get, man, they get off on going over the speed bump in the Ralph's shopping center. Whoa, did you feel that? That's what we can do to our faith sometimes. When we, and that's not living in the abundant life that Jesus is speaking of. And so we need, we need to first ask the question, how is Jesus going to bring us the abundant life? How is he uniquely, more than any other influencer or voice or leader, bringing us abundant life? So first, Jesus leads the way to abundant life. So John 10, starting verse 1. It says, or Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. So Jesus uses this word picture of a good shepherd or a worthy shepherd. A shepherd shepherds were not think of very highly in that day. So a good shepherd, one that you would want to follow that would lead and guide and protect you that you would know its voice. This is man this is a very desiring picture that, that Jesus is is painting for us and that is in uh, contrast to the thief and robbers that would get into the pen, right? There would be a gate or a fence and then a fence all the way around the pen, either made of wood or rock or stone to protect the sheep from predators. And Jesus is putting himself in contrast with those that get in the pen the wrong way. Jesus is saying, I come in the right way. I am the worthy shepherd to follow. And those that follow me, man, you will know because you will hear my voice and recognize it. Man, he he is calling himself a worthy shepherd. But this is, again, when you look around at the outside world, man, this is in direct contrast because our society is, 
in terms of abundant life, it is set up in a very different way than following Jesus. It's set up to get more stuff or more experiences or more people clapping at your name. And so this is going to be um, seen as like a foreign language, it's not something that we see on TV. There are different wants and desires, but even think of Palm Sunday in which we're celebrating today. People had different wants, desires, and goals in that scene. You had the high priests who, they were there, they were really, they were supposed to be bringing the people, connecting the people to God, but really what they cared about was the status quo. Keeping the peace, keeping a hold of their authority and power while keeping the Romans at bay. So that's why Jesus, could you please quiet down the disciples as they praise your name as you ride in on the colt? Or you have the disciples who, when you read the Gospels, man, it really feels like what they want is Jesus to come in and overthrow the Romans. And then you have Jesus himself, who he is willingly and knowingly riding into Jerusalem to his demise to save all of humanity. Jesus, yes, amen. This is, this is going to be a foreign language to the others that you hear. And so when, when, when you see that people are unsatisfied with their vision of the good life, man, it's like St. Augustine when he was praying, my soul is restless until I find my rest in thee. Man, what about power? Talk about powerful words. Man, so in thinking about next week, next Sunday, man, this place is going to be hopping. It's going to be one big party to Jesus. It's going to be great. I'm, I'm really excited about it. But I'm also, also intimately aware that in terms of numbers of people who do not call on Jesus as their Christ, Lord, Savior, King, is the highest Sunday than any other Sunday of the year. Because people bring their friends or their family, their sons, daughters, their grandchildren to Easter, and they're just wanting to go with grandparents and then go to a really nice fancy brunch after church. They're just trying to make it through the hour. And so we, as the Apostle Paul, he describes people like that as veiled face, that they cannot see the glory and the magnificence of the gospel of Jesus. And so in terms of even thinking about Easter, man, I would ask you to start praying for next week, one, to prepare your hearts, but to also prepare for those who are going to be hearing the gospel for maybe the first time, or at least seeing it with an unveiled face. I would invite you this Thursday, come join me and, and some of the other staff at 7.30 this morning, in the morning on Thursday in the ocean room. That's exactly what we're going to be praying for. Anyway, so in terms of uh, back to Jesus, man, seeing who he is and what, how he leads us, he primarily leads us how? Through his word, through how he has instructed us, how he has told us to live. And in seeing him as God, man, how do we approach him as God instead of this just crazy man shouting out on the corner? And we need to approach him like how King David approached God, how he spoke of the words of God. And one of my favorite passages, Psalm 19, you listen to how King David describes the word of the Lord. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So the word of the Lord, or how we see it, as the words of Jesus even are perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, pure, firm, all righteous. They are greater than gold. They are greater than anything that you can physically possess. They are sweeter than honey. Anything that you can taste and in living them out, there is great reward. That reward, what King David is describing, is the abundant life or the outcome of the abundant life. And so that's why when we look at any, you know, 
cutting edge cultural topic today. When the question is, what is our authority? What should be the desired end? Oftentimes it's, man, that biblical view, that is so outdated. That is so 2,000 years ago. Does Jesus really mean that when he says that? Yet more than ever, I believe Jesus' words are relevant to our everyday life and decisions more than ever. I mean, he is speaking as a worthy and good shepherd. And so those of us who follow Jesus as the good shepherd, I mean, we are to depend on his word, depend on his leading of us. So second, how is Jesus uniquely qualified to lead us to the abundant life? Second, Jesus is the way. First, he leads the way. Second, he is the way. Look at verse 7 with me. Jesus says, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And so Jesus, in some ways, kind of mixes metaphors, which is, you know, you're not supposed to do that today, but back 2,000 years ago, that was okay. The Apostle Paul does it as well. Jesus, so he he's first is the good shepherd. Now he is the door to the pen in which the sheep live in. And he's saying, man, Going through me, that is the most natural of ways. You can be in in the safety and the pen and coming to me, then you will go out and find pasture. Have your needs filled. Go and have, live in abundance. And this is echoing the words of Jesus in, in John 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the Father except through me. And man, when you hear anyone say words like this, you go, man, that guy, that fool is crazy. Except this is Jesus we're talking about. The same Jesus who's been healing the sick. He has been feeding the 5,000. He, he has been bewildering the, the Pharisees and the rabbis of the law. And they're going, what is different about Jesus? He's either, either he is demon-possessed or he is who he says he is. He is God. And he calls himself the gate. What is, what is significant about being the door? The thing about the door is you have to go to a door and go through it on its terms. A door doesn't come to you. You go to it and to make it work, you have to know how to make it work or have the key in which to make it work. When my wife and I, we moved into our house, I don't know, five or six years ago, uh, our house came with one of those new fancy padlock locks, right? You put in the number and the deadbolt opens up. And, and so we never carry a key. And we didn't even realize there was an old-fashioned lock with a key in the regular handle. All right, the one. And so really the rule in our house was don't ever touch that lock. Just use the deadbolt lock and you'll be fine. So we never carry a key. And that worked until our two-year-old decided to play with the regular lock. And so, you know, in the busyness of getting out of the house, we didn't realize that he had touched the handle and the new lock and just went and lock the door, we, you know, get out of the house, we shut the door, get in the car and go about wherever we were going until a few, and we didn't realize this until a few hours later we return home. You know, and you, you put in the, the code in the lock and it opens up and it sounds like the door is open and yet the other handle is locked and we are locked out of the house. So now you're into, man, how do I get into my own house mode, right? I'm going around the perimeter of the house, see if we left any door or other windows open. And man, it was locked down. It was like Fort Knox, except one bathroom window, which was about 12 inches by 12 inches big. (laughs) And man, you would have guessed, I took off the screen, I opened it up, and I'm trying to get up high enough to get into this small window. I I was afraid my neighbors were going to call the cops, some burglar trying to get into this house. And... I said, I do not want to get into my house every time that way, (laughs) right? That is a little unnatural. What is the natural way into the house? It's through the front door. And Jesus is saying the most natural way in and out of the pen, in and out to greener pastures is through me. There will be others that forge their own path or come in over the gate, but that is unnatural. You are not going to experience the abundant life that way. I mean, look how, I mean, and Jesus knows about life because he was there at the very beginning to create it. 
Look at look how John describes it in, his, in the first chapter of John about Jesus himself. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And so Jesus, the word, is God. All things are made through him. In him is life. And when you hold on to Jesus, that is your light that shines into the dark place. That is what people are to see, that you are a follower of Jesus, the very giver of life. We are to come to terms, his terms, come to him, and that is going to be the most natural way in which we were created to live because Jesus is the bringer and giver of life. And he is the only one that uniquely who knows, who authored and created all of life. But we can treat Jesus like my college professor who was a financial planner and he was talking about his industry. And, and in our class, he was saying how, you know, people who come to a financial planner, they're paying their financial planner to make a financial plan for them. He said, guess how, what percentage of people actually follow our financial plan we give them? And in class, we were guessing, you know, well, 50%, maybe 30%. Man, I was shocked. He said 10%, 10% of people who pay for a financial plan actually follow through on it. The number of percentage that even goes even further of people who actually do everything the financial plan says. It's, it's shocking, but we can treat Jesus that way. Jesus, yes, you are my king, you are my savior, you are my Lord. But you know what? In this one situation, I could just move in with my girlfriend. I think I know better than that. Actually, you know, in terms of my finances, you got everything else, God, but this. I, 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 can, I can manage that on my own. Or, or my schedule, or how to raise my kids, or how to approach school, and, and what is the right way to, to study and prepare, and what should I be even be aiming for college and the rest of my life. And we can easily just say, God, you know, you know everything except I know this situation better. Jesus is the door or he is the gate. We should bring him any and everything, every aspect of our lives as he is the way to abundant life. And so we are to depend on his way. And, but this isn't easy, is it? Because we have other people like we've already discussed, talking and shouting at us different ways, ways that are maybe shinier at times, maybe are fancier at times. But as Jesus alludes to, man, these are robbers. They're not coming in the, through the gate. They're coming in over the fence to try to rob you of your abundant life. Look back at verse 10, how Jesus describes it. Don't miss the contrast. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come or I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I mean, that contrast is so intentional that the thief or the robber with all these different ways of living or modes of living or way of worldviews, man, all it's going to do is kill, steal, and destroy your abundant life. Yet Jesus, he's coming to lead. He is the way to bring us to abundant life. I mean, how many people have we seen sacrifice their families at the altar of their career? Or how many siblings, grown siblings who have grown up and had all the experiences of living in the same household grow up and then not speak to each other ever again because they can't figure out the family estate or divide it evenly? I mean, or how many of us just wake up in the morning and we go to the good word of social media? And just filling our lives with anxiety and depression. When we're not, when, when, when we are seeing Jesus as the gate and we bring everything to him, man, it is a whole thing. It is, it is something that's going to change our lives because immediately it will change your life. It means it changes how you make decisions. It changes your heart posture. It changes how you approach people that you like and that you don't like so much. And then you're going to start seeing changes in others for all eternity. And that is what we are created for. 
just like the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, he says this. He says that for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I mean, just think about that. There, there are good works created for each and every one of you before you were ever born. Man, imagine the thrill in walking through those good works that God knows you so intimately. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. And yet he gives you little blessings, little boxes of good works to fulfill in your life. Man, I can't think of anything that's more exhilarating or thrilling, living out, getting to be a part of those good works. I think of last month, one of the baptisms that we had was this gal who her husband had been praying for her he had been having discussions about Jesus with her and encouraging her in her faith for 12 years. Imagine that moment when, when getting to baptize her for the husband. And there was not a dry eye in the place when they were sharing about the transformation that she has seen through Jesus, yes, but through his faithfulness. Jesus is the way. We are to depend on him in all things. And then lastly, Jesus pays the way. Jesus leads the way. Jesus is the way. Jesus pays the way. Going back to the good shepherd metaphor, Jesus, he points to what he is willing to do for his sheep. Look at verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That he isn't just worthy of leading. He is willing to go down with the ship to save all of us willingly. He later goes on to talk about the, the hired hands or those that don't have any skin in the game. As soon as it becomes hard, as soon as it becomes difficult, as soon as the wolves come out, what do they do? I mean, they're like, I'm out of here because I'm, I'm not giving up for this flock. It's not mine. Jesus is saying, you are mine and I'm going to give everything for you. I mean, even think to Palm Sunday, right, that we're celebrating today, riding into Jerusalem on that colt. Jesus knew what was coming. No one was forcing him. He wasn't under compulsion, but he willingly and gladly sacrificed his life for all of us, paying the price that we could not pay. The one who knew no sin became sin so that we might be what? The righteousness of God. Okay, so Jesus leads the way, he is the way, he pays the way. What is this abundant life that Jesus talks about? What, what does it look like? What, is, what does he mean by it? Well, Jesus answers that question. Look at verse 14. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. So the abundant life, more than anything else, more than stuff, more than experiences, more than the people in your life, is being known and knowing Jesus Christ. And this isn't just like a mental thing. This isn't just something like I, I mindfully know Jesus. This is an experiential kind of knowledge. This isn't like how I know my favorite sports teams and, and all the players on it and, and the stats from this past season or how I know from freshman math, right, in geometry, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Has anyone ever actually used that in real life, a one person? <laughs> it's not that kind of knowledge. Man, this is an intimate experiential knowledge where you have walked with him day in and day out, bringing your issues, bringing your questions, bringing your hurts and your pains and your successes to him, laying him at his feet. Lord, what do I make of this? I mean, just, just like a couple that's been married over a half century, faithful to one another. I and mean, we're talking like that kind of knowledge because he likens that to be known by Christ and we know him like the son knows the father. Man, these are two heads of the Godhead. They're they are one. We are to become one with Jesus in knowledge and experience of him. So that means we, we bring everything to him. So the creator of all things wants to know you and to be known. And so the abundant life, no matter what's going on in your life, is to grow in the knowledge and understanding of Jesus, to have this real life 
experience and experiential knowledge, to, to know that the ways of Jesus are, are going to affect your life and be better for you than what you feel in the gut or whatever other people are telling you. I mean, it's going to be risky. It's going to put you in situations where, like, your palms are sweaty, where you're going to be risking real things. It might be your reputation. It might be status. It might be a position. But everything else runs out. But Jesus never runs out. And so the big idea this morning is, as the creator of all life, Jesus brings abundant life through intimate knowledge and relationship with him. And this isn't a lone wolf proposition. This isn't just something you can do by yourself. Jesus will go on and he, he will tell us that, man, we are to do this together because we learn about him in and through each other. Look at verse 16. Jesus says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. And so Jesus, through laying down his life and taking it up again, which we will celebrate in one week on Easter. Man, what a morning it's going to be. He is bringing together. In, in Jesus' day, it was Jews and Gentiles. Today, it is all of us into one church, and we get to do it in community, sharing with each other one another's burdens and praising the successes that we see in Jesus. When we, when we are living in the abundant life, when we are in knowledge of who Jesus is and experiencing him, I mean, you're not going to help it. You're just going to see, man, the abundant life happen all over this place. I got to experience one one abundant life happening just about a month ago. Here at our church, there's been a family who's been attending for the last two or three years, real tough situation, broken family. So one, that kind of situation that just kind of drags on and on. There's two kids in it. One of them is, one of the daughters is a junior higher. And she's actually was baptized about a year ago. I mean, great story. We invited the family over to our house for dinner and we were just talking about camp. Winter camp was coming up. And so we're talking about it. And, and this junior high girl was so excited for winter camp. And we were talking about winter camp and what she was looking forward to and what she should expect. And, and like, and it just rolled off her tongue like it was nothing. She just said, well, if it wasn't for South Shore's church, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for my church family, I wouldn't be here. And then just continued talking the conversation like she hadn't said anything. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. What did you just say? And, and, and talking about it, I finally got to the point of being able to ask her, well, who in our church family had the most impact on you? I mean, who through Jesus had impact on you? And she named her leader, Reagan. And so this was a Saturday night. So I, I, the next morning we got to church and I looked for Reagan. I, Reagan, I got to tell you something. I told Reagan everything that this student had said and Reagan's eyes got this big. And she said, I had no clue. I had no idea. I mean, think about what that's like for Reagan. Reagan doesn't live close. She lives about 30 minutes away, works about an hour away. How many Wednesday nights would it have been easier for her? You know what? I don't really want to drive all the way down to Dana Point. I'm just going to cancel tonight. How many Sunday mornings would have been easier for her just to, to sleep in instead of drive all the way down here and then lead her group of girls? But because she saw the worthiness of Jesus to pour into these girls, seeking the abundant life through Jesus, man, there is a junior hire that's alive today. That is the abundant life. When you see Jesus working through you, because, man, he is our great leader as our great shepherd. He is the way, and he pays our way for the abundant life. Please pray with me. Dear good and gracious Father, we just thank you for this word from Jesus. I pray that we will live the life, the abundant life that he brought to us, that he makes available to us. And Lord, it is a privilege, it is an honor that we get to do it together. And so Lord, this week, prepare our hearts for Easter, that we will grow in knowledge and understanding of who Jesus is, the price he paid, what he means when he says he is the good shepherd or he is the gate, that we are to come to him, that we are to trust in him. And Lord, I just pray this week 
that you will continue to restore, restore the joy of our salvation. And that we, that as we live, Jesus will be our life and the light that shines in the darkness as we leave this place today. We pray this in your son's precious name. Let's stand together. So how many of y'all coming back next week, huh? Are we ready to celebrate?
this week as we are preparing for Easter, let us follow the way of Jesus by his lead through him and through his sacrifice. Amen. Amen. Let us go live the abundant life, go in his grace.